Hello? Hello? Seeing how close I need to stand to the microphone? Um, so my name is, uh, I guess I'll just get started. Um, my name is Robert Caracas. I work in Australia at a web agency called uh, Previous Next. And um, yeah, I'm here to talk about Drupal generated markup, not being your friend, and why you should use a style guide. Uh, we've been using a style guide for the past, I don't know, two years now um, at Previous Next, and it's been, you know, it's really up to my theming skills, I guess, I guess I would say. It just, it's been interesting using it. Um, I want to talk a little bit. I heard Dries talk. My last session I did in DrupalCon Austin, uh, I talked about Angular and all the stuff that Dries is talking about in his key, keynote about how, um, you know, like how these front end frameworks are kind of happening and stuff. So I talked about, you know, creating a Drupal theme in Angular, and I, I thought it was really cool. And I, I still think a lot of these client side frameworks are really cool. But Drupal 8's coming out, and there's going to be some tools that, you know, we can use in Drupal 8 on the front end, and I, I thought it would be good to, to put forward a presentation that talked, went in a little, to a little bit how we're doing theming now, how, um, you know, what, how we've done theming in the past, how we're, we're doing theming now, and how in the future, you know, front end might, might change a little bit, especially relating to the release of Drupal 8. Um, the last speaker's slides were really nice. Mine are kind of Figuring me figuring out Reveal JS and some code examples and stuff. So I'm a front end developer, not a designer. <laughs> um, but yeah, so let me get started. I guess first, how many? I don't like putting ourselves into a box, but how many people here would call themselves like a front end developer? Front end. So most people are front end. That's that's good. I don't have to explain things too much. And then the last one, everybody was back end developer. So um, SAS, templating engines, maybe handlebars, things people are familiar with. Um, or semi-familiar with, so that's, that's good. I'm going to have some of that in my presentation. How many people here work in like an agency? Say an agency versus internal, a lot of people, so I'll have a lot of in common with people. Um, this is like a common design that you might get. I don't know if people are doing design in different ways. A lot of times we get a Photoshop file with something that looks like this. Really common, something common that you might uh, put into Drupal. You know, you have an image, you have a title, might have a link, um, and a back-end developer might think, okay, or anybody, you know, if, you're, if you're familiar with Drupal site building, you might think, this is a perfect case for something like views, right? Um, a list of nodes that link off to a detail page, classic case for something like views as, as your site building choice. And um, the quickest way to style something in reviews, you know, say a back-end developer is in charge of configuring some advanced configuration for that view and hands it off to you, being the front-end developer, the themer, or maybe you have to do it yourself. Um, and you look at the markup, and the markup looks something like this. And I made it small because it really doesn't matter what is there. Just you can't read it, and it's kind of terrible. Um, but somewhere in there, you're going to find these classes that you can grab onto and theme and make your make what what the, what is given to you kind of look pretty um, yeah they're in there somewhere I've kind of mocked it up a little bit using position absolute <laughs> um, this is the class you're gonna find and I just I don't even know if that's the right one I looked at it I think so it doesn't really matter but basically Drupal classes they give you this prefix that you have to that's usually the name of the particular site building module of choice, and then followed by some sort of ID that you might identify by. Um, and that would be the container, right? So views, view, homepage, grid. Say that they wanted the view on the homepage. Uh, and then you might have an item. These are the things that are important to you. You want the item because you're going to do some sort of grid setup, and you want the container to do maybe a max width or something like that. So this might be the, if, depending on the views plugin that's being used, depending on a couple of different things. This might be the class that you choose to attach your, you know, your grid-based styling to. Um, yeah. So this is, I guess, the code that you might use. I mean, this is SAS, so it's kind of nested. Uh, yeah, you might start off by just putting some code into styles.scss. You might just have one file for all of your, your, your different components around the site. So you, know, you have a max width and you have a width 33%, kind of makes sense with what we've 
it's shown. Obviously, there's going to be a whole other set of slew of properties, CSS properties that you're going to have to attach there. Um, but yeah, you, we're not. I'm not going to put those in for example's sake. I'm just. This is just you know as, as an example. Um, yeah. So you've, you're able to pretty quickly get that view up and theme the way that design looks just by attaching some, some styling to some Drupal classes uh, spit out by views. But then, say, further down the line, you have to add other implementations of this grid uh, in different sections of the site. You might have one on the home page that we discussed, but there also might be another instance on a landing page where you need to do some promotional items. Uh, and there might be a, some related content on the bottom of a node page, like, in a, like an article page that shows a, links, a, a list of articles in a very similar fashion, in a grid fashion, as, as the design I showed before. Um, and this, the site builders and, and product owner and, and client might have special requirements. So the views is fine for the home page, but there's going to be all sorts of other site building. I mean, on every Drupal site, to me, it seems like there's a, people are using a million different site building tools. You don't just settle on one based on what you need based on the content editing experience. Um, for instance, the promo might be done in paragraphs. That way you can give the, you know, the, the client or the site builder uh, a way to add images and, and things, uh, curate content on a per node basis. Um, the related content might need to use entity reference because you might want to have a database relationships between the articles and other articles and show them on the bottom of the page. Um, and then the promo, might need to be purple or something. Anyway, the, the, the specifics around this are not important. Just kind of say that we're using a lot of different site building and, a, and there might be different sections of the same design on other parts of the website. Um, so using paragraphs, just to go through it quickly, you might have a container, par whatever, whatever paragraphs gives you, paragraphs container and a, and a paragraphs item. And you're going to do a very similar thing that you did in the view. You're, gonna, you're going to... Um, you're going to you're going to you're going to style the view and the very the paragraphs in a very similar way to the view. Obviously, there's some, a little bit of variation here, but the point here I'm trying to make is um, that even though I'm putting these these are using very simple properties, right? But and two different implementations of 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 this grid and using different site building um, tools, but. This CSS, even though it's listed together on the same page here for demonstrations purpose, could quite probably be in very different parts of your style sheet. I'm not sure how you're structuring your, your partials or how you're structuring your, your CSS, your SAS, or whatever preprocessor you're using. But oftentimes, you don't even know. You, you'll style these things. Again, depending, maybe a project manager a week later says, style this bit. You'll go and style it all over, even though you've already done the styling, something very similar in the past. So, yeah, I mean, this stuff might happen, might be in a lot of different places. Let's see if I can zoom down here. Yeah, and here's your entity reference. You might have another thing. This, and this happens. I've looked at some old projects, and, um, you know, we've had this very same thing. This is what was happening two, two years ago, three years ago. Um, and here's an example. Excuse, uh, I'm not pointing out that he just made the last commit, but um, Will, poor Will. Uh, this is just... An, an example of a project. This is when we, but maybe two or three years ago, when we were putting every, all the styles in the same, in the same style sheet, basically everything in styles.scss, because that was the easiest way to kind of do it. How are you going with this sort of these sort of classes and this sort of markup? How are you going to organize it in any other way? How are you going to make how are you going to make partials? What are you going to make partials based on paragraphs or based on views? They have, really have nothing to do with what the actual design looks like and the di different components that the design might look like, um, that make the different patterns that make up the design. Um, uh, this is hard to see, but it really doesn't matter. Um, I just noticed this, but this is, this is on another project a couple of years later where we decided that we wanted, because the one style sheet's very hard to maintain, so we decided we wanted to um, you know, break things up. In, in, in a more organized way. But in my opinion, it kind of just made things harder. You can't really see this, but it says node article. This is the article featured. And, and, and the class inside, the class is inside of, bottom line is that the class is inside of the particular partial has not, have nothing to do with the actual name of the partial itself. So by looking at the partial, it tells you nothing about what's inside of it, um, which to me makes things hard to organize. 
So with these problems, uh, and there's, there's more problems to do with Drupal default Drupal markup, but I have to move through this. So, um, you know, the, the industry as a whole, front end as a whole, have, have come up with a kind of a better solution. Um, and there's all solutions, but I think that the, the settled on a solution in the last couple of years have, has, have been what's called design components. Where you use, and it's very similar to Drupal modules, if you think, where you, you come up with a name, any name for a component, and pretty grid, it really doesn't matter. Um, there are some rules that have to do with it, with the naming, but in the end of the day, as long as it as a unique name that describes the pattern, it doesn't matter. You describe, it's kind of like a Drupal module, you know? You just, you have a, a, a namespace, and then you have subcomponents that go along things. You're grouping things together. Like in a Drupal module, you might have the name of the module in the beginning, and then as, as a hook or something, and then you might have some sub, some functions or methods inside of there. So, and that's what, you can follow the same pattern in when you create uh, what, what the industry is called like design, design components. Um, it's important that the naming of these components don't relate to uh, Drupal configuration. So you don't want anything, any naming in your, in your I mean, um, this is all opinion, by the way, so don't take it anything to heart. You can come talk to me after, but this is how I kind of do things. The naming of your design component or your, your namespace to, to kind of conflict with Drupal and confuse you. Um, you also probably don't want it to, to have anything to do with the actual content because you might have different content flowing in and out of these design components. For example, if you call this article grid and you wanted to have pages or some other content type flow through here, then that could totally cramp your style when it comes to you know, styling it in the future. Um, yeah, and you know, sub, you can have the item, but you all you can have some components, tiny subcomponents too. Like maybe the title is slightly different than something else. Um, so what does the CSS for this looks like? In my opinion, a lot cleaner. You have some namespace classes. I'm using the actual name of the component itself, Pretty Grid. Just made it up, by the way. Um, and you, you're actually putting it into a, a partial key. So you can see this partial is named the same of the, as the class. So all of a sudden it becomes a lot easier when you're looking around your, your markup and you're looking around your website. If you see a component named Pretty Grid, then you know that you can go and find uh, Pretty Grid in a nice partial somewhere. And everything to do with Pretty Grid is, is, is in, inside of that partial. Um, and you can see it, I'm using the name of the component as a container, but you can also just as easily say, you know, underscore, underscore, container. And these underscores and dashes and stuff, this is uh, using a, um, a methodology called BAM. And I'm not going to get into the rules. It's a little bit complex to understand. Uh, John Albin, my coworker, has gone in through the, over the last couple of uh, se his sessions and gone into kind of the nitty-gritty of BAM and, and talking about a lot of, of the syntax. But I wanted to bring this... this um, this kind of methodology up again because I think it has to do with some more stuff I want to get into. Anyway, so here's pretty grid item. You have your 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 width, your grid item widths, and you might you know add a larger font size for the title. Just example. Um, but with your CSS, you really, in my opinion, you really want to have uh, example markup. First off, for for two reasons. First off, prototyping. I mean, in Drupal maybe five, six years ago when I was, seven, eight years ago when I was first, you know, beginning, I didn't even know how to write markup. Drupal did everything for me. I made views and it spat up the markup. And I was theming. I was doing a lot of CSS and I was working for companies and stuff, but I, I didn't know how to create markup. I, didn't, I just knew that Drupal spat out divs. So when you're creating the CSS, you have to actually write the markup uh, by hand, which is good because you have more control over it. Um, so for prototyping, you need to write that markup, but also for documentations. I mean, this is a simple, simple component right here, but imagine if it was more complex and you had grid systems in there and you had responsive media queries in there. It, it can start to get quite complex. So you need to understand the source order and actually what's going on inside of, of each component, especially in a responsive age, um, and especially when you're dealing with you know, uh, accessibility attributes, ARIA attributes, all, all sorts of things that you need to be able to, um, you know, to have a tab on. Um, so documentation and for prototyping, you should have example markup. So basically, in my opinion, the way that we do it anyway, every class that you write in Drupal, like when you're theming a site, every class should have markup documentation that shows what is happening with your CSS so people can understand coming in maintenance in the future. So fuglies. 
Um, this is a concept brought up by you know, my coworker, John Alvin. He's the author of the Zen theme, which Drupal's, uh, you know, I guess, largest or you know, most used uh, base theme and most downloaded. And uh, yeah, this is how you might apply. So you apply your, these nice design component namespace classes to your Drupal selectors. This is his solution for that. And what you do basically, I mean, Fugly can kind of, uh, a kind of a cool story, a funny story is that I was working on with him on a project and he named these things Fugly selectors. We all know what that means, I guess. Um, but he's, it was, I guess, for a kind of more high profile client. So he's changed the name to, you know, just Drupal selectors. I like, I like the politically incorrect name, but anyway. <laughs> Um, yeah, so what you do here is you have your, you know, your pretty grid, your nice namespace component based classes, and then you come in and you extend these classes onto Drupal selectors or your fugly selectors. And this lets you manage your different instances around the site um, in, in a good way. And it also, what it also does is allows you to cut these out. If you ever want to use your design components or your, um, if you ever want to use your design, which is, um, now to translated into HTML and CSS, and it's, it's it, you know, you might want to use it in a non-Drupal setting. You might want to use it uh, for some, some splash page or some, some promo for another brochure site or something. You want to use some of those components. You can just cut out these fugly selectors, and then you can go and use that. And one use case you might want to do is going from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. I remember going from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7, a lot of times what we would have to do is do a full rebrand because our design was so embedded into whatever site building opinions we had, which were the actual fugly selectors, whatever the site building tools we were using at the time, those were embedded into our design because we were attaching our, our styles directly to Drupal selectors. So this is, in my opinion, uh, a must have for, for um, you know, be able to maintain your site and be able to retheme your site if, or trans, tra you know, trans, transport your site in the future or moving to Drupal 8. <coughs> Anyway, I thought I'd put an example. I've talked about some of the different parts, but I want to talk a little bit about a, a, like a full ex show you guys like a full example of what like a complete component might look like. One of these partials, and this is not just something um, we're using at Previous Next. Um, this I've had a look at some other frameworks, and Ubuntu's vanilla framework has a very similar example where they to, to this particular um, example where you actually put the markup inside of your SCSS file as documentation, as some sort of, to show people, okay, well, this is what the CSS is actually doing. Um, so you can click there and see their example there. Basically, you go through and you might have some styling of your pretty grid, and, um, and you might have some fugly selectors. And you can see that these fugly selectors start to get a little bit intense. You, you have to start mapping them, but they're mapped in, in a pattern. Oh, I didn't escape. Those are supposed to be underscore, underscore. Um, they're mapped in a, in a pattern that is um, is consistent, um, and 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 it's abstracted. Your design is now abstracted from Drupal, which is really important moving into the moving into the future. So here's just another example of a little component. So, in my opinion, no matter how s small your CSS, no matter what the little tweak is, it should always live in a component. And it's, it's confusing at first when you first start getting into this kind of idea, but it ends up making a lot more sense as you, as you work with them. Um, so even something as small as like a, a read more link or something, obviously you would probably have more properties than that, just for example's purpose. Um, yeah. So that is another example of a component, and it, and it has a little bit of markup. So extending design patterns. So when you start building your designs like this, um, or building your themes like this, or whatever you're doing, you can s start amassing these components pretty quickly. You start having quite a few of them. And some of them might be, I don't know if anyone's heard of like Pattern Lab or Atomic Design. You might have smaller components that fit into larger components. And for example here, um, the way you kind of do that from a CSS perspective is, you know, you can, well, before I say that, these components do something really important as well, the namespacing of them. They basically break CSS. They take the C out of CSS. They take the cascade out of CSS um, to where whatever happens inside of one of these components 
shouldn't affect what happens within the other components. Now you can write things um, and be totally sure that because of namespace, I mean, we do that all of, you know, in computer uh, you know, programming or whatever all over the place. Um, but yeah, that's an important thing. So the cascade is basically broken. We don't care about it anymore. Um, unless you kind of do care about it, though, if you are wanting to use CSS from one component in, in a smaller component um, in, in a larger component. And here's a perfect example. Um, in our pretty grid title, remember the little, the title with, let me see if I can go back real quick. The title, oh, here it is, I guess, with the title with a little arrow. Um, you might want to extend, that, that arrow could be a complex, you might have an SVG, you might need to position the SVG over to the right, you, need, you might need some padding, you might need some CSS3 properties, you might need auto prefix or stuff, you might need some responsive things that happen. So you might have quite a few properties there. Um, and you might not want to write that over and over and over again. So you might, in, in the title, you might want to say, well, this is pretty similar to read more, but actually the font size is a little bit bigger, and then maybe you have to move the arrow around, or maybe the font, there's a different font family or something like that. So this is a way, by importing, this is a kind of a SAS thing, but other preprocessors have a similar um, uh, sort of setup. By importing the, the uh, uh, subcomponent and the, in, in the head, or not in the head, in the, in the top of the page, you can ensure that that CSS, based on, I mean, using Compass in this particular instance, you can ensure that the CSS will actually come, bef the read more CSS will come before the pretty grid title uh, CSS, which is actually becomes important. That, in that case, the cascade is important. And by using dependencies, um, by listing out a hierarchy, you can start doing some pretty cool stuff and reuse code where you might not have been able to reuse it. And when you start doing this, you start seeing a lot more patterns in your design when you actually have the tools uh, to, to do something like this. Um, so this is just uh, something we've been doing recently. And it's, so I showed you an example of having the HTML, the HTML documentation inside of the actual component itself. Um, and putting all the different languages in the component is, I guess, uh, it might make, if the component is complex, it might make the, the partial pretty big. Um, I guess they do that in React components and some other components. They, they, they put everything into one file. But I like the idea of kind of splitting out your different uh, language dependencies into different files. So Pretty Grid might have some CSS that it requires. It might have some HTML. Um, it also might have some JavaScript that does some, something fancy, maybe equal height grids or some fallback or something that you need, particularly for that component. And I'm not going to get into JavaScript dependencies and stuff. I think there's some other sessions that talk a little bit about that. But um, yeah, I like putting HTML, uh, long story short, in a separate file because then you can, and with your IDE um, and your, if you ever want to do anything like linting, you can use, uh, your IDE won't bug out, freak out. That's the main reason for me. Um, yeah, and they do this. This is not just something I made up. This is, they do this in Google Material Design Lite, which is a really cool framework um, by Google. Google came out with their, their material design spec, uh, I don't know, a year ago or something, and they, they were tr they're hoping to implement it with web components, but I guess they're a little bit too complicated or not ready yet with Polymer and the like. So they've come out with, um, well, Material Design Lite is just a vanilla HTML, CSS, JavaScript implementation of all of their um, uh, material paper design components. Anyway, so yeah, like I said, you might have a lot of these components and um, you have a lot of this example markup and you have nowhere to prototype and you're creating static sites and boilerplate HTML files just to see your components because you want to create components in this way. Really, you need some tooling that's going to allow you to take this HTML and actually visualize it because just looking at the HTML at the top of a file, I mean, it will give you some hint of how it's supposed to be used if you're familiar with HTML, but you really need to see it with the CSS actually applied to it in a setting that is referenceable, you know, and in like a catalog sort of setting. And that is where um, a style guide might come in. So a style guide, when I first heard about style guides, I think like all I thought, I, I thought immediately of the, the um, AP style guide, like of, of writing content and how to structure content, because um, I've done it in college. Uh, but and, and MailChimp does something similar to where they talk about the voice and the tone that they might use 
you know, if you ever use MailChimp, they have the funny little jokes all around when you're trying to create email campaigns. Um, yeah, th so that's this is this is a style guide for for content, but this is not really what I'm getting at when I talk about like a tool that can help with our markup. Uh, what I what a lot of designers think when you tell them, well, you know, we need a style guide, we need com uh, component based design, they think, oh, um, like element collages or style tiles where you have some colors, they give you like a Photoshop file with a couple of colors in it and then some, uh, some typography and it's like, here's your style guide. Well, it's a little bit more than that as well. And, and uh, going back um, to Material Design Lite, they actually have a good component library. And I think that's more the word we're looking for. Um, a component design, a component library. And I, I guess I call this a static component library because all their components are just HTML, CSS, and and JavaScript. And this is really cool. You can actually click on, you know, these, you can't do it in here, obviously, but you can click and do Chrome Inspector and actually see how these things are made. And, and you can actually open them up in CodePen. I like this style guide a lot. Um, yeah. And you can see the markup here as well, which is really important. And, and it has a catalog of all the different components. So the tool that I'm talking about is more of a style guide generator. And that's what we use. Um, we use a, what's called a style guide generator. And we use a, pro, uh, a project called a KSS Node. Now KSS stands for Nile Style Sheet, just something that some guy made probably a couple years ago. And he made it in Ruby. And GitHub used Nile Style Sheets, the Ruby version, for their style guide component library. Um, uh, yeah, so why do we use KSS Node instead of KSS Ruby? Well, front-end developers tend to know more JavaScript than they know Ruby. Um, and so it's easy. If something goes wrong in the style guide, you can you know, make a commit. The other reason, I guess, we use KSS Node at Previous Next is because John Albin, who's um, my coworker, he's the maintainer. He's not only the maintainer of Zen, he's the maintainer of KSS Node. Another reason that people in Drupal might want to consider um, KSS Node is that now in the latest alpha version of Zen, a KSS Node is included by default. And all of the, the, the components, CSS components inside of Zen Starter Kit is you know, basically built around the KSS Node style guide because John's a maintainer of Zen and of, of KSS Node. Um, now, just to note with KSS Node, KS, and this is a pretty big, um, when people are coming and learning it, uh, it's, it's, they, KSS Node does not care about CSS or JavaScript. Uh, it only cares about markup. So it parses your CSS files and looks for markup, basically. And a feature of KSS Node is that you can specify that we've added recently, um, what I mentioned in the past and before in the previous slide, is that you can add a separate markup file, and KSS Node will know about it. KSS Node is just an NPM package. You download it, and you can use it in the command line and feed it a few arguments. Um, yeah, so we need a way to get all of the CSS, all of the HTML out of all of our components and all of the CSS out of our components, all the JavaScript out of our components and get it into our style guide or our KSS node style guide and our Drupal site. And the way we do that is with some tooling. So we use Gulp um, to uh, basically on, to, to watch our saves, basically, and KSS Node will parse out the HTML from each one of our uh, components, and we, it allows us to follow this component-based workflow and parse it into you know, these performant you know, one HTTP request, CSS file, JavaScript file, and HTML file. Now, KSS Node is just the blue. It just cares about HTML. We have other uh, sessions that might talk about the CSS. I guess I talked a little bit with the imports and stuff, but then JavaScript is something else altogether. Um, this component-based uh, uh, this component-based methodology is is going to be pretty prevalent when web components come out uh, or when they're supported in in most browsers. And um, yeah, it's important that we start looking at building building front end in this way. <clears throat> So this is what it looks like after, after your HTML and your CSS has been parsed. Uh, your, your CSS has been parsed of all the markup documentation. Uh, KSS Node will give you a it will catalog for you your 
particular component. And look, it's just a very small component here. It's not nothing big, and it's not very pretty. It doesn't look like the, the, the material design light style guide. Um, but it serves an a, 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 a important purpose because now we can, take, um, we can take a URL, a reference, to this particular component, and we can send it around the company or send it around our client or, or our, our development team, and we can iterate on this particular component and talk about it and reuse it and maybe even do testing on it. Maybe we can um, do some sort of uh, screenshot rate testing or something. I mean, that's a little bit too much for this presentation. But it's having a URL for something is, is really important. Um, and your markup's there as well. You can actually see the markup that's used. Obviously, you can look at it in Chrome Inspector, but it's nice being able to look at it right next to the actual component. Um, and you can find all of your components pretty easily. And this is a huge benefit when you're developing. It's a, it's a really important, and in my opinion, for larger sites, that like a must-have uh, workflow, whether you're using KSS Node, there's all sorts of other style guides out there now. Um, yeah. So... Um, a little bit more about uh, like a, K a design component, but then KSS Node has some, some interesting things in it as well. First off, it's, I mean, we have a CSS file in our normal static, um, our static HTML CSS JavaScript components, but KSS Node doesn't necessarily need to use HTML. It can use HTML, but it can also use the templating language of your choice, like a template file. And using a template file means that you can have variables, just like, you know, think of any of our Drupal templates, or if anyone's played, everyone said their front-end developers played with, uh, you know, templating engines or anything. You can actually, in our components, we can have data that moves in and out of our uh, components, which is really important if you want to start ch uh, having, uh, using your components in different places. You need the, the, the titles to say different things. You need to have different contexts. You might need it to be different colors. You might need to feed it different classes. You need to have variation in the heap of mark, uh, uh, you know, in the component that you're trying to edit. And it also lets you, so KSS also lets you um, specify a JSON file, which has some, some default data, basically placeholder data for that component, because obviously in the style guide, it's not something that's dynamic. You just want to have something there that you can you know, just see in, when it gets generated. So I'll show you an example. Some of this might have been confusing, waiting for the video. I have a little, little video, which I made on the plane. <laughs> um, let's see if this works. Uh, one second here. Can I do this? Ooh, OK. Huh. Okay, I have to do it over here. One sec. Okay. So this is just an example, just so you can get an idea of how this might work. You know, you have your 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 component, maybe your, your read more component. That's what this one is, and it has um, you know little specks of data in it, and um, in the JSON file and in, in the same component, you're going to have. Uh, you know, you're just going to specify in JSON the URL and the title, and then you can uh, do gulp watch. It will compile the style guide. You can start to see how the tooling comes into effect here. And if anyone has any questions about the, the logistics of that, I can walk you through how that works. Um, and then, obviously, you can come down and you can see your component in the style guide. Here it is, and then you can see where the data, the placeholder data, has been shown in the style guide. Uh, and this is, becomes really useful. It might look, you know, a little bit uh, hodgepodge here, but it's it's very useful to be able to do this. And um, so, so I'll uh, show you why. Because like the CSS, being able to reuse components um, from one CSS file, or one partial, and reuse it into another, and be able to import a whole list of properties into uh, um, maybe a sub part of your component. You can also, do, with CSS, you can also do something like that with, with markup. And that's what, that's what these templating engines are all about, is taking pieces of markup and being able to mix and match and reuse them um, and place them within other pieces of markup. And with that, you can start to big, build bigger and bigger uh, components. Um, and this is, this is Pattern Lab. This is, th th this is their um, idea of a page, you know, where just so you have all these components that are... Uh, compiled together, not compiled, but you know, included. They, they're just including a bunch of different components on the page, 
and those components have micro components. I guess they call them molecules and atoms, et cetera. And you could do a similar sort of thing with KSS node or whatever templating language you're using. Now, a question is like, how do you get some of this markup that, that, that and these classes um, into Drupal? Like how, so we've created these nice, um, these nice CSS component based uh, selectors uh, and we, we have markup too that goes along with that. And we need to either get the classes into Drupal, you need to get the markup into Drupal. Now let's talk a little bit about these fugly selectors. So I have a little fragmented slide thing that I made here. Um, on the left, on the left, on the left you have uh, like the pretty gray cart partial that we talked about before. And inside of it you have some extended fuglies. On the right you have your views view grid or whatever your views template file is or your view implementation that has Drupal markup in it. Now the problem with fugly selectors is that if you get rid of that, that Drupal implementation, you then need to go into your partial and you need to fish out all of your fugly selectors if you want to maintain your code. You could just leave it there. Nobody would know the wiser probably. I don't know. <laughs> but um, you need to, uh, you have to go and fish through your, your components and pull out the fugly selectors. If you actually use the markup though in your template file, you don't have that problem because you're able to get rid of your, your, um, your template file which has the nice markup in it and you don't need to worry about maintaining uh, the component because the component doesn't have, the, the design component doesn't have any Drupalisms in it. It's just fresh and, and it's by itself and is abstracted. So in my opinion, using classes is a preferable solution. But we all know Drupal. Getting classes in Drupal is not easy. Um, you have these theming functions which go on forever. Luckily, they're gone in Drupal 8. Um, don't, if you have to use one of these, just use a fugly because you don't want to have to maintain all that PHP code, forked PHP code. Then you have markup UI. And I can go on a, little, a long time about you know, getting, using panels. And I know Dries said we need to make it easier for people to you know, point and click. But maybe five years ago when you can add a few bootstrap classes and you can kind of make a desktop style site with a few classes. But in my opinion, having to, uh, you know, when you have more complex components that have responsive properties, you have to deal with performance, you have to test them, you have to do a lot of things. Getting all of those classes and all of that markup into Drupal using Display Suite Extra or, you know, using Panels classes is quite difficult. Now I worked on a development team where it was great. We because we had the style guide and we had all the classes listed, the devs were able to go into the style guide, rip all the classes out, and get them into Drupal, which is great. I mean, it's really sped up development. But the problem is maintenance, because on that site currently, if somebody needs to go in and, not to say that you shouldn't follow that method, because it's way better than using the Drupal selectors, um, if somebody needs to go in and change anything, they do a command F for that particular class, because you have the, the panels are all full of markup, and you find C tools, you know, configuration, because all the, that's where all the classes are stored in C tools exports. So it's a little bit uh, difficult and it's just very verbose filling these things out over and over again. I don't have a solution for that. I'm just complaining a little bit. Um, you know, layout UI is a similar sort of thing. It seems to me whenever you drag a pane into, you know, the panel's admin interface, you have to restyle it again. Um, it doesn't, it, just adding a class or something, it's not themed. You still need to get the themer to iterate over it again. And maybe if you create it in a really good, in a nice, perfect way, it, it works. Um, I'm running out of time here, but uh, yeah. So the, actually, I think I'm, I'm doing all right. Um, so benefits of Drupal templates. I'll just rehash some of this again. Preserve the compo component source order. So if you're actually using Drupal templates versus, you know, fuglies or you know, just attaching your classes directly, your styles directly to Drupal classes, you're able to see the markup and, you know, uh, preserve that component source, uh, sorry, markup source order not component source order, markup source order, that's so important. Um, there's no configuration management, so you're not having to, if you're using template files, you're not having to actually um, you go to features and refresh that configuration because it's just stored in Git. The configuration or the, the, the HTML is stored in, in uh, version control. And then, yeah, you can search in the ID. I find it a lot easier to search things in the ID. Um, so a disadvantage. Managing template files in Drupal is hard, like the naming convention, the naming conventions around Drupal templates like node dash dash article dash dash my special suggestion and template.php is not easy to, to deal with. And, and people come up with all sorts of nifty ideas on how to manage that. Um, it, it can be difficult sometimes. So I'm not, I'm not d denying that. Um, du duplicate templates. So I want to talk a little bit about this. This is a problem that bugs me in particular. It's probably more of a pet hate than, than I know a, a, a 
a worldwide Drupal problem, but duplicate templates. So because we have the, the standard, you know, like previous next, that whenever you write CSS, whether you write uh, a component, you have to have example markup inside of, of that. You have to evidence your, your CSS with uh, a working example, HTML example. We're writing markup no matter what. We have to write markup because it's part of the development process. Because we're writing markup, we're also writing markup twice, or we're copy-pasting markup. So what we end up doing, because KSS Node is written in handlebars and Drupal is written in PHP, um, the only thing that's different here is the, uh, the variables. So one's PHP template and one's like little brackets. It sh we should be able to somehow reuse and duplicate, especially when you have a more complex component that has a lot more HTML inside of it. This is just a simple example. But re remember we had views, we had uh, paragraphs, and we had entity reference. Imagine taking that, that example on the right and having to copy paste it in each one of those template files. You start to find yourself duplicating templates a fair bit there. So what if Drupal could actually use style guide templates? So what if the, te the templates in Drupal could actually leverage what we have in the style guide? Because the style guide has become such an important part of our development process. Um, you would have, Drupal would have to be able to use handlebars. Uh, that's not happening. It's the Drupal 7 and, you know, it's not, that's not going to happen. I'm not writing that. I'm not dealing with that. <laughs> KSS node could use PHP template, but then you'd need a JavaScript implementation of PHP template. That's not going to work. Luckily, the Drupal 8's got Twig, and that's where things start to get interesting, because Twig is written, you know, Twig is written in PHP, so Drupal could potentially use it, but it has a syntax that's more familiar, to, more similar to handlebars. It uses the same brackets, um, but that's that's not really going to going to help us. I mean, Drupal 8 Twig is and Twig is awesome for other reasons, like it's more secure. Um, you know, we're not writing SQL queries in our template files, uh, but um, you know, just because it's similar does not mean it's it's handlebars. You still, uh, and that's where it gets interesting again because there's something called Twig.js. Twig.js is a JavaScript implementation of Twig, and which means that Node or KSS Node, which is written Node, Node is a server-side implementation of JavaScript, can leverage Twig.js and use it. And it's templating. So instead of using handlebars, KSS is currently written, you know, has a generator that uses handlebars. It could potentially use Twig. Um, and Drupal's already using Twig. Drupal 8 is already using Twig. Um, yeah. So I wrote a pull request to John, um, you know, John Albin's KSS node, and it's passing now. It looks like it wasn't passing then. But yeah, I have basically wrote a generator that lets, tw lets us use Twig inside of KSS Node, which is, which is interesting because now you're using the same templates as Drupal might use, which you know, gets, gets you closer to making your style guide look like what is, is going to be in Drupal 8 in core. Um, and I have to write some tests and stuff. That's always the hard part when I have to learn JavaScript a lot better than I already know it. Um, but yeah, that's, I'm trying to get that in, and I'm, I'm sure when Drupal 8's released, there's going to be a lot more momentum around getting something like that released. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Twig, some of the syntax for Twig. What I'm particularly interested in are the includes, and in handlebars, the includes, I showed an example before, the includes look something like this, where you have this little arrow, and it just like, kind of includes things for you. Um, in Twig, the, I've, I've spaced it out weird, but just so it can be used in the example. Um, yeah, you can just include in a very similar fashion, uh, and then you can start, you, you know, includes the first step into building these larger components. And we can do this in Drupal 8 core. This is not necessarily a style guide thing. Uh, so we can start mixing and matching our components, hopefully, whether you're using a style guide driven development or not. Um, extending is another interesting um, concept to where you can have this markup, and this is actually, uh, extending is used in core as well. I, th uh, I think in the classy theme, or somebody will tell me after the, after the uh, session, but it basically allows you to add markup to particular templates. And um, yeah, so you can have, uh, you know, here's block.html.twig, which is in Drupal core, and this, this potential child template is extending it, and then just adding a little bit of extra markup around the content to make it, you know, maybe make it match our design or, or, or what we need a little bit better. So, um, 
We're using KSS node uh, a Drupal template. So you might want to, what you could potentially do, and I've had a play with this and it's looking pretty good, but it's not 100%, um, is you might want to take something that is inside of your Drupal template, and, inside of your style guide, sorry, that's written in Twig, and extend it inside of a Drupal template. And this would let you avoid having to have, uh, having to write, you know, having that duplicate markup in, in all these different template files. If you can just extend what's already in your style guide. And then potentially if you change something in your style guide, it's also gonna be changed all throughout your Drupal site which some people might see as scary because who knows what's changing, but we shouldn't, as developers, we shouldn't think that that's scary if you're, you know, you should have to be able to test for things like that and hopefully, you know, that sort of stuff evolves. These are just some ideas at the end of the presentation that I'm throwing out there. Um, I just want to show you one quick thing that, you know, you might want to do here, just one more video, um, about reusing templates. So... This is an example I put together, you know, I played with. This is the, always the fun part of these presentations. And this is the KSS style guide. Um, and this is a, a title of, of the grid item that we had seen before. And um, this is a Drupal site. So this is Drupal 8 site, a Drupal 8 site that I spun up. And it's using that same template. So I got them using the same template. I was able to extend the template in here into the, into the Drupal 8 site. Um, so it's, it is using the same template here. Uh, to, to, to do that. Now, to kind of prove that, I guess I'm going to put a, a, a inline SVG into my template, which is being used by both the style guide and Drupal 8, and I'm going to compile my, my, my template, or I, I guess, you know, generate those, that static HTML style guide, and now you can see that, obviously, that inline SVG is there. But because Drupal is also using that template, and it's, it's I, got, I have twig, de, twig debug mode turned on, obviously, so it's not caching the Twig file, so any changes that I make, it will automatically be seen. Um, and I go to my Drupal site, and I refresh, uh, then obviously the, the inline SVG is there. So there's an example of, and you can imagine having the views homepage, the promo, uh, promo landing page, and then the entity reference, and having all those template files just being uh, automatically updated, and there's no mistakes there. Everything got made. If it's using that component and extending it, it got made. But one interesting thing um, that can also happen, and this is our style guide, by the way, is because we're using Twig.js, templates can not only be leveraged, like Twig, you know, Twig works in, Twig.js works in KSS Node on the server side, because it's in, it's in Node, but obviously JavaScript works in the browser as well, so there's no reason why um, uh, front end, like, like the browser, can't leverage these templates as well. So what you can do is um, write a little bit of uh, JavaScript that maybe lives in its namespace nice with your component, lives with your component, and without even having to do anything um, in Drupal or anything, just write some JavaScript and that that include Twig.js in the you know in your in your in your browser, and then um, yeah, and then you're just able to kind of pull in you leverage a template, feed data through it, uh, maybe using that GraphQL that Dries is talking about, and yeah, leverage the same templates on your style guide and on your Drupal in the browser. Uh, and yeah, this is I'm not going to get into the JavaScript. It's relatively simple, and um, yeah, and in your Drupal site, remember we just did that in our HTML, uh, in our sorry, in our style guide, uh, but it should theoretically the same just work in your Drupal site as well. No need for AJAX, views, plugins, or anything like that. Um, and just yeah, so just knowing that, oops, where am I? Oh. Yeah, so just knowing that that stuff exists, that stuff's out there that using Twig's gonna be huge. Having a template engine in core is gonna be, you know, it's gonna be a, a, lot, a big tool for us um, as front end developers. We're gonna be able to, to mix and match and do a lot of things with HTML and with client side uh, development. And, you know, uh, we're gonna be able to do a lot of stuff. So just knowing that those tools exist, understanding that what the benefits of a style guide, being able to catalog all of your components, being able to iterate on a development team, being able to show the client, you know, and show the designers, Things so we're not we're not you know rehashing all this work over and over and over again and writing all this stuff time in and time again time in and time out um, is going to be really advantageous to us moving forward going in uh, to Drupal 8. 
So I guess that's it from me. You can find me on Twitter. That's my name. And yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I use KSS for prototyping. So whenever I get a new design in, I just go into the style guide and I make it all in the style guide first. So I don't make a whole site in the style guide. I would never do that because you know, you don't want to waste time, the client's time and stuff. You want to do it in like an agile sort of fashion. So when the story comes in, you just make the, the HTML and CSS that has to do with that particular uh, component. You build that component and and then you prototype it. And then you worry, I, I estimate them separately. So I'll estimate the, C, the HTML and the CSS. And then the separate is the Drupal integration. And then everybody can see the cost of Drupal. What does Drupal cost? What is the integration actually costing us? Because you shouldn't have to worry about Drupal when you're actually doing all the responsive stuff and, and performance and trying to figure out how the component should work in the browser the best. Pattern Lab's written in PHP. But I think, let's go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure I haven't used Pattern Lab. So the question is, you know, whether KSS node is similar to Pattern Lab. I'm sure they have a lot of similarities. And um, yeah, I haven't used Pattern Lab extensively. Yes, sir. Uh, not yet, but I don't see why not. Like, once it's all set up, it's really easy. If you know just HTML and CSS, you should be able to. Uh, iterate on those. Doing presentation, this presentation's as much for people in my company as it is for the outside world because I'd like people to understand that the style guides is not just some, you know, some thing, some like colors and stuff on a page. It's actually a really important development tool that can allow other employees, maybe people who don't have experience with Drupal, to do half the work on the on the project. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> Good question. I've tried. I would put the image. If oh, I'm sorry. My bad. So the the question is is whether or not I put the images that have to do with the component in the component folder. And if it's like a background image that has something specifically to do with that component, then I would do that. Uh, or if it's a placeholder image that has to do with the demonstration and the, and the testing and the documentation of that component, I would put the images in the folder. But then you're going to have to reconcile that. You're going to have to reconcile the paths. You're going to have to deal with the tooling and how it's pulling the image out and whether the, the path is absolute or relative. And there's still problems moving forward, but hopefully the tooling will get better and, and, and standards will get better around building things like this. Anyone else? All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, sure. So I am working on something yeah. um, where you have to have plugins. Like right now, you could write a Swiss plugin yeah. and put your grid or something, your grid HTML into this plugin, yeah. maybe in a template or something. But it's still a bit annoying to write a views plugin, and then you cannot use it if you have, for instance, field items. Uh, and just want to have a field formatter with field items, and you cannot use the same uh, grid or whatever you have. Mm. And so what I'm doing is um, no, no, I think writing a bunch of different okay. plugin types. Uh -huh. yeah. You can have my own plugin system for that. Uh, for right now, on this demo site, you just have this list format. Yeah. And there's another one, entity display plugin. Yeah. And for instance, this is my article view. Yeah. And now I have integrating this. Right now, you just have these two, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, so like each one of this has different options. Yeah, and but in a, in a client side, what I work on, uh, you have.